Let's get started. Uh, today we're going to be covering the period from 400 BC to 8900. It's a little bit long. Uh, first, for, to start off, let's look a little bit at the development of how do you get to heavy shot cavalry. The first combat application of the horse was the war chariot. And when I was playing Civilization II many, many years ago, I was trying to figure out why would you have a chariot before you have a cavalry man? Because it seems to make a lot more sense to sit on a horse rather than build this gigantic thing behind it. Well, in order to understand the answer to this question, you need to look a little bit at the evolution of the horse. And the horse evolved from a very small animal called Eohippus, which lived around 50 to 55 million years ago in, incidentally, North America. And this was only about 40 centimeters tall. So, a very small, let's say, dog-sized creature. And as over the next couple of dozen million years progressed, the climate in North America became cooler, the forests receded, the grasslands spread, so the descendants of Eohippus became progressively larger. So you have Mesohippus at 60, Meohippus at 80, Merichippus or Merichippus at 100 centimeters, until you get to the modern horse, Equus, at 130 centimeters in height, uh, which first of all around three and a half million years ago. And these horses crossed across the Bering Land Bridge, perhaps around 9000 BC, and then the Bering Land Bridge was no longer there after the Ice Age ended, and very shortly after the horses went extinct in North America. But they spread through Eurasia fairly quickly, and then people were using them there, and they were no longer available for Native Americans. So, at the final step of this natural evolutionary process, you have a horse which is only about a meter and a half in height, and it's not particularly strong. So, the horses that were available to early cultures, they could carry a person. But they couldn't carry like a rider in heavy battle gear, heavy armor, or heavy weaponry, because they could literally not lift that much weight. So you see people riding a horse, but that's just for casual riding, and because these horses were not really good for much of anything else. Uh, horse domestication happened around 4500 BC at the earliest estimates, around the uh, uh, Mes around Mesopotamia, and it's not entirely sure certain where clan breeding became frequent, as opposed to just breeding horses just to have more horses. But it may be possible that Arabian horses might have been first bred around 2500 BC, and from Turkmenistan there is another breed of horse called the Ahal Teke, which might have been first bred around 1000 BC. And these were bred eventually to be hived, so around 150 and 160 centimeters for both of them. And Right, around 500 BC, a number of cultures began to breed horses of unusual size, as was described by several historians. The most famous of these was the Nisean horse developed uh, or bred on the Nisean plains in Iran. This was a very tall and robust and very sturdily built horse, and was considered to be the most valuable horse of its time. It was bred in fairly small numbers, primarily for the nobles to use as their primary uh, or their royal uh, steeds. And small numbers were occasionally stolen by Greeks and Scythians and then interbred with local horses. So, uh, we will get to the horse in just a moment, but as a little bit of an aside as to where cavalry begins to act in warfare, we have a, one of the early battles in Greek history where cavalry had a very decisive uh, impact is the Battle of Leuctra. And this battle is one of the most impressive battles that I read about mostly because I found out about it recently, and the tactic that was used here was brilliant. So, in this case, there was another Greek civil war. There was the Boeotian League, led by the city of Thebes, that rebelled against Sparta dominating, because Sparta was dominant in Greece right after the Peloponnesian War. And Thebes sent an army of 6,000 hoplites and 1,500 cavalry, facing Sparta's 10,000 hoplites and 1,000 cavalry. So, the general who led the Theban force, his name was Epimedonus, he came up with an interesting strategy. At the time, the way that the Greeks lined themselves up was every man would be holding a shield in his left hand and the spear in the right hand. So that meant that the shield of the guy on your right was supposed to cover your right side. So as the phalanx progressed, it would drift towards the right 
because everybody was trying to push into the other guy because they were scared and didn't want to get hit by spears. So normally what you would do as a Greek general to prevent your entire phalanx from just slowly strafing to the right as they're progressing is you put your best and battle-hardened warriors on the right so that everybody pushes against them and then they keep the line going straight. So this meant that the strongest forces from one army ended up meeting the weakest forces from the other one, and vice versa. So at both flanks, <coughs> everybody sort of intermixed really rapidly, and he, whoever happened to have the best overall experience on his, on his army pretty much would win. In this case, Epimedonus knew that, first of all, he has significantly fewer soldiers than Sparta, and he couldn't possibly match the Spartan flank. So normally what you would do is you try to arrange your soldiers to match the entire width of the front of the enemy army so that they couldn't turn around and flank you. But in this case he knew that if he did this he would have to stretch himself too thin. So while the Spartans went into battle in their normal formation about 10 ranks deep, he took all of his best warriors and lined them 50 ranks deep on his left, right against the Spartan right. And he put his cavalry on his right against the Spartan left. And what ended up happening was the battle began with a cavalry exchange. The Spartan cavalry and the Theban cavalry engaged. The Theban cavalry was significantly more experienced. So they drove the Spartan cavalry right through their own infantry. And what ended up happening is the infantry that was on Sparta's left was then disorder, disorganized and disordered, and they needed time to basically reform themselves. While the Spartan infantry on the left was reforming themselves, Epimedonus struck with his elite gigantic block of 50 files deep, right at the Spartan right, and pretty much killed the king within a few minutes with the entire Spartan general command. And after that, the Spartan ranks kind of fell apart. They were routed and ran away and lost the battle. So this was pretty much nothing but brilliant from the point of view of Epimedonus. But it was also the first time that you really see a cavalry unit being instrumental in winning a particular battle in Greek history, or in fact, for that end in any history, because while the Persians did have some cavalry, it was mostly used for flanking attacks and the mass, uh, the majority of the battle was still won by infantry. Uh, the victory of Leuctra led to nine years of now Thebes dominating pretty much all of Greece. Uh, they campaigned against Thessaly and captured young Philip II of Macedon, who, while in captivity, because he was technically a prince, he was basically learning military strategy under both Epimedonus and another Theban general called Phil Philippides. And then after returning, Philip became king of Macedon and became, began fairly strong army reforms, primarily based on what he saw at Thebes. Uh, Macedonia, thankfully for him, had a strong heritage in horse breeding, and among that probably had some Nisaean derivatives. And there was also some contact with Scythian horse breeders who were pretty good as well. So, uh, in addition to that, he had uh, to rely on uh, Xenophon's treatises of horsemanship. These were the oldest works that did went into detail, both on training and care for the horse, as well as training and responsibilities for the cavalry officer. So, his treatise called On Horsemanship uh, de details how do you choose a horse that you want to use for war, how do you break the young colt, how do you care and groom the horse over its lifetime, uh, how do you ride the horse either in simple or advanced modes? And uh, what kind of equipment do you need for the horse and the rider? And then cavalry commander uh, lined up uh, selection and training for cavalry recruits that might be going into the officer corps as well as just the regular cavalry corps. Uh, unit formations for force marches, parades and combat where he laid out how should you lay out your cavalry units during uh, these phases and require personal uh, qualities for the commanders. So things like bravery, responsibility, and other relatively obvious things. Uh, we get to the Battle of Crocus Field. Uh, this was the bloodiest battle of the Greek Civil War, and this was now Philip's new reformed army with his new cavalry and his new infantry fighting to expand their influence to south. So in this battle, he led 20,000 infantry and around 3,000 cavalry against 20,000 infantry and just 500 cavalry from a city called Phocis. The Macedonian cavalry pretty much routed the entire Phocian army, and what ended up happening was 6,000 Phocian soldiers were killed, and then 3,000 taken prisoner, and then drowned, supposedly, for the crime of uh, refusing to pay a fine to the Temple of Apollo. So this now we see uh, Philip taking the lessons he learned from Epimedonus 
and then using his cavalry extremely decisively in the field. Uh, if we look at the innovations that Philip had in the army, uh, the most important one for the infantry was the heavy Macedonian palace, or the foot companions. These were, this was a fairly deep structure, uh, so the regular unit uh, called the Sentakma would have a 16 by 16 square. These carried a very, very long spear called the Sarissa, it reached up to 6 meters in length. And what this meant is that you could have five ranks of these spears all reaching forward in front of the first person. So whoever was trying to get into this formation and attack it from the front would have to fight his way against five rows of spears from 16 men on the, on the, flank, on the, on the front. Also, uh, he had a built-in and extensive training system so that the entire unit would be able to basically turn around, move, and do pretty much everything necessary in unison. The spears of the men behind were kept at high angles, first of all, so as to not, not to stab people in front, but also as a some sort of limited defense against arrows, because arrows coming in, seeing this force of spears, would most likely be deflected, and then when they hit the people, they are significantly slowed down instead of coming in at full speed. Uh, then, in addition to his heavy phalanx, he had elite infantry called the Hippa, okay, something, something, shield bearers. Uh, these were derived from early Greek hoplites, but they had significantly better equipment and new types of equipment available as well. Uh, they still carried a round hoplon shield, a dory spear, and a tifo sword. These were used to guard the flanks of the phalanx, because the phalanx is really impenetrable from the front, but from the sides it's very vulnerable because it's difficult to swing all those spears to the side uh, to defend yourself against a flanking attack. So the elite infantry would protect the flanks of the phalanx and then make sure that the phalanx can just proceed forward and not really worry about having to be not, not having to worry about its flanks. Also, these covered the gaps between the phalanx and the cavalry. Uh, the main thing that he did for the cavalry and the most famous unit associated with the Macedonians were the Hitairoi, the companions, or the companion cavalry. Uh, these were the technically the first shock cavalry in the world. They were armed with a four meter lance, and this was different because most earlier cavalry just had javelins that they were intended to throw at the enemy and not really used to charge the enemy with a lance held in hand. Uh, they also had a Tifo sword for close combat in case they lost their lance. Their body was protected by a new type of armor called the Linothorax, which was basically thick padded linen over many, many layers that was actually so thick that it protected you against arrows or sword slashes, but it was much lighter than the bronze armor that was worn by some, something like the, the earlier hoplites. The head was protected by something called the Boeotian helmet. This was much more open than earlier Greek helmets and looked, I guess, more like a summer cap, except made out of bronze. And this allowed you to have very good vision and very good hearing, that way you could hear what everybody around you was doing and hear the commands of your officer and your vision was not obstructed as it was in the hoplite helmet. These were typically deployed in a wedge formation that was introduced by Philip II of Macedon. Uh, the reason for this is that a wedge formation is very effective at breaking up infantry because once you open up a split, it's easy to fo continue forcing that split as opposed to just charging an enemy infantry line with a square block. Uh, it's also easier for the leader, which in the cases of Alexander of Macedon was Alexander of Macedon himself, to carry the entire unit on a turn maneuver, because when you have a square, it's very difficult to get news traveling along the sides of the square, but when everybody's following the one leader up ahead, he can do whatever he wants and everybody will follow anyways. And all, with all of these advances, you basically get to have the first shock cavalry that was intended to actually charge against massed infantry, as opposed to just hold some standoff position. And these were the first cavalry that were extensively trained for specifically melee combat against infantry formations. So to uh, this cavalry force was effectively the hammer that was supposed to beat enemy forces, and the phalanx was the anvil. So the, the phalanx would put the enemy where he wanted him to, and then the companion cavalry would come in and slash at the enemy army left and right. Uh, the entire battle formation that Philip had uh, was something like this. At the very front you had the psiloi, these were basically irregular troops with, with uh, very light equipment. They were supposed to skirmish right before battle and attempt to throw javelins or rocks or whatever it is into the enemy army to try to break up their formation before they actually met with the main, main, main force. The heavy phalanx, which is in the middle here, was the primary infantry force. It was 
supposed to engage and then hold down an enemy enemy army where he wanted it to be held. The primary cavalry force was typically on the right, and the, these were the companion cavalry. These would have been used to attack the enemy flanks and disorder sectors and basically chop the army up into tiny little pieces. And then finally, in addition to these, he had miscellaneous light infantry, uh, light cavalry that were from allied cities that were used for essentially giving him local support where he needed it during the battle. Uh, this force was used by Philip II, but most famously it was used by Alexander the Great. Uh, he was technically Alexander III of Macedon, but pretty much everybody forgets about the second and the first, so we just call him Alexander. Uh, Alexander was the son of Philip II, and between 334 and 323, so just 11 years, he conquered pretty much the entirety of the Persian Empire. Uh, this shows a map of the empire that Alexander ended up conquering compared to the Macedonian Empire he inherited. And his primary campaign is drawn in red. Uh, a couple of major battles that he had, uh, that Alexander had during his uh, war with Persia. The first major one was the Battle of Issus. This was technically his second victory against Persia, but the first one that he actually took into Persian, Persian territory. In this case, he led about 5,800 cavalry and 35,000 infantry against 11,000 Persian cavalry and 70,000 infantry. And the strategy for this battle is that uh, the Persian cavalry initially attacked the Macedonian left wing, and the Macedonian left wing retreated a little bit. Meanwhile, the Macedonian infantry punched through the Persian left, which was significantly poorer uh, armed and poorer equipped than the phalanx. And right after they punched through, the cavalry rushed through the gap that was opened up. And when there was the gap opened up, Alexander not only charged his cavalry, but he charged them directly at Darius. And Emperor Darius of the Persians freaked out and literally ran away from the battle in his chariot, which left his entire force completely uncommanded, and the Persians were outed. So the battle was a success for the Greeks. Uh, something fairly similar happened in Gaugamela, the two years down the line. This was Alexander's largest victory in terms of the number of men and equipment that was involved. In this case, he led 7,000 cavalry and 40,000 infantry against the Persian force, which was a little bit over two times as large. In this case, he knew that he couldn't really uh, manage to match the entire Persian unit in terms of either numbers or the width of his front. So what he did was he moved his flanks over to the sides to draw away the Persian cavalry. While the Persian cavalry was trying to fight his withdrawn flanks, they basically opened up the entire Persian center, which he then rushed with the phalanx and the cavalry together, and pretty much once again rushed towards Darius's position. Darius again ran away. In fact, at, at Issus, the previous battle, Darius ran away so urgently that he left his wife and his daughters. And at this battle, he left so urgently that he left all of his treasure. So he literally ran away on a horse. And after this, the Persians were also routed. There was a little bit of intense fighting on one of the one of the flanks, but pretty much the entire Persian army was once again defeated. So with these two battles, he pretty much took Darius down to a level of a pauper who was running away and trying to hide. Eventually, Darius was assassinated by his own satraps in Persia. And uh, Alexander went through the rest of Persia, conquering as he went. Uh, around the same time, we also have the first real siege weapons beginning to appear, and technically the birth of artillery. Artillery, one, according to some historians, the first, the, the first weapon that might be considered as the grandfather of the catapult was this thing called the gastrafetis. It means like the stomach thrower. And it's it's a very large handheld crossbow using basically just an oversized bow on a crossbow frame, invented probably around 450 BC in Greece. It was drawn by pressing down on the lever with your belly, and the front part, which would slide backwards and forwards, would be pushed back until it reached the location where it popped, so you could then pick it up and shoot at an enemy. Uh, an engineer called Sopiros developed a version that was mounted on a stand around 420 BC, so this might have been a similar design or something a little bit heavier, but the main thing is that this would have been the first range weapon that came on a stand where you could just have it in a single position and then fire repeatedly from that same position. Over the next couple of decades, 
Other engineers developed uh, larger and more complicated versions. This is the Oxybilis, which is essentially the same thing, but now it's much heavier, mounted on a significantly sturdier frame. And instead of having somebody pushing the uh, or drawing the string manually, you have these levers, which you could turn to draw the string before firing. And in this case, power is provided once again by the flexion of the arm, so just like in a regular bow or a regular crossbow. Now, around 340 BC, we get to the ballista. This was the first torsion-powered weapon. The difference between the ballista and the crossbow, or the bow in general, is that the energy for firing a ballista is provided by these springs. So if you think about a rope, which you twist and turn, and then it's going to want to untwist, that's called torsion. So here you basically have these really, really thick torsion springs, which you deflect by drawing these arms backwards, and then it's not the desire of a piece of wood to decompress, but it's actually the desire of this large spring to decompress that gives you the power to shoot your bolt. Uh, typically, the springs were made out of animal sinew, which was fairly stretchy compared to other materials, although there are reports of having torsion catapults powered by hair. hair. And what it allows you to do is basically, it gives you significantly more power and a more compa compact package than something based on just uh, the deflection of a piece of wood. And these were, there are reports that these might have been adopted by Philip II, but the first time that they were recorded being used in battle was at the siege uh, of the city of Tyre. That was a siege of Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great also reportedly used these in a few of his battles as field artillery, basically just to bombard an enemy army with fairly large bow, bows or bolts or stones so that he can break them up before engaging them with his major infantry and cavalry. Over the next couple of decades, the ballista evolved into extremely large versions. Uh, this way here is a three-talent ballista, so it will be firing rocks that are almost 100 kilograms in weight. Uh, ammunition for these ballistas included bolts, so basically not quite telephone pole, but almost a telephone pole size spear. Uh, rocks, other types of projectiles, uh, human carcasses or human heads sometimes if you wanted to dis um, depress a city. And when the ballista was introduced, it opened up very different possibilities for siege and field operations that were not available back before you had something that could fire basically a human sized ball at an army. Uh, there is a saying that's supposed to have been or uttered by King Archidamus of Sparta after he first saw a ballista where he said, oh, Heracles, the valor of man is extinguished, basically that, to mean that nowadays, or before this time, it was just how strong or how brave a person was in battle that decided everything, but now you can be as strong and brave as you want, but you get hit by one of these and you're no longer strong and no longer brave, uh, which is somewhat unfortunate. Uh, with the ballista, we see significantly better siegecraft. Uh, this is some of the equipment that was used at the Siege of Rhodes, uh, this was Demetrius Polyrcides. Uh, this was one of the descendants of the generals of Alexander Macedon. He decided to besiege the city of Rhodes. Uh, the city of Rhodes was uh, allied with the Ptolemies, which were, a, which were descendants of a different general of Alexander the Great. Basically, after Alexander's passing, his generals split up the empire into four sections, and then they started infighting amongst each other quite uh, vehemently. And uh, Demetrius was called Polyrcides, that means the besieger, Ironically, that means that he did besieging really well, but he never took anything. Uh, so, this was probably the most epic weapon that he used. It was called Helopolis, or the Taker of Cities. This was a 40 meter tall siege tower with a base of around 20 by 20 meters, total height of about, or total weight of about 150 tons. So, basically, heavier than pretty much most tanks these days. Uh, this was armed with two ballistae, which fired 80 kilogram boulders on the bottom floor. Uh, four 30 kilogram ballistae. On the second floor, there were three, and on the bottom floor, there was one. And then the next five floors had two ballistae, which would fire 15 kilogram boulders. And then on the very top two floors, you had four ballistae, which basically just fired arrows uh, against infantry. And mobility was provided by eight wheels, each of which was four and a half meters in diameter. And these, this whole thing was driven by a capstan on the inside of the siege tower pushed by 200 men and then pushed from behind by another couple of hundred, if necessary. So you basically have a small city approaching an actual city, and ironically, the siege tower never even made it to Rhodes, because what the Rhodians did 
was they saw this thing coming up and they just diverted a part of river right in front of it, the ground became bog and the siege tower just got stuck. So it was never particularly effective, but it was built and it was probably the most epic thing that people could have looked at in ancient Greece. Uh, in addition to the Helopolis, he used galleys, which were mounting ballistas. These were not the first galleys to use artillery, but this probably would have been the first time that they were using quite such large numbers, because he was really determined to try to take roads. Uh, he also used undermining teams, so these were basically teams of miners who would dig a hole underneath the enemy wall, and then hopefully the wall would collapse a little bit into that hole. His teams here were not particularly successful either, but uh, at least they were attempted to be deployed. Uh, he also used battering rams, uh, some of which may have been used with smaller siege towers, but most of them would have been used in just fairly small covered structures that sort of would look like a little little house on the prairie, I guess. And reportedly, the longest ramp he had was 55 meters in length, but that's probably an exaggeration because historians back in the day like to exaggerate everything. And he didn't take roads at all. So, all this equipment and for nothing. There's a story about the Helipolis, which I'm not entirely sure if it's true, but supposedly after the uh, siege was lifted, the Macedonians just left the siege equipment there, including the siege tower. So the Rhodians, what they did was they took everything apart and sold it, sold it for scrap, and used the money from that scrap to buy all the bronze to make the Colossus of Rhodes, which also then stood for a few decades and then was brought down by earthquake. So, now we get to Rome, my least favorite topic because there's way too much stuff to talk about here. So I'm going to try to talk about only the most important stuff. Uh, the early Roman Republican army, which would have basically been the descendant of the Roman uh, kingdom, or, or of the army of the Roman kingdom, was based on the Greek model. So one of the things you'll notice about the Romans is that they invented very few things. They just mostly adopted and borrowed and or stole ideas from pretty much everybody else. But then they implemented them much better than anybody had than any of the people who initially developed them, so I guess it worked. Uh, the primary strength of the early Republican army was based on just a heavy infantry phalanx. If you look at this, you'll notice that the equipment is very similar to the Greek phalanx. You have a circular shield, a sword, uh, a spear somewhere, greaves, a giant cuirass, and a fairly hefty helmet. And uh, the early days, the Romans also still had technically a small number of flight cavalry, but this was mostly drawn from the nobility and re was really only used either for reconnaissance or very, very light flanking attacks from afar. Uh, in 315 BC, the Roman army was reorganized into something called the Manipular Legions, which the Romans, uh, or part of the concept was, bor was borrowed from a couple of other tribes that the Romans were fighting against at the time. Maniples consisted of 120 to 160 soldiers, and uh, each maniple was made up of one type of infantry. There were a total of four types of infantry, all of which are represented here, and we'll go into those specifically right now. The first group were the Velites. These were light skirmishing infantry, so just like with the Macedonians, these would be at the very front of the army, and they were supposed to skirmish with the enemy before the main armies closed their ranks. Uh, these were primarily armed with javelins to throw at the enemy and with short swords for combat if they happened to be stuck in the middle of the fray. Uh, the second one were called the Hastari. These were armored heavy infantry, uh, but not quite as heavily armored or armed as the early Roman uh, phalanx. These would have primarily had leather armor and maybe a brass uh, breastplate or sometimes a chainmail shirt. Uh, they had a modified helmet called the galea, uh, also greaves and a curved shield that was made out of wood and a little bit of iron uh, that was generally resembling the more famous Roman rectangular curved shield, but this was still somewhat circular and smaller in overall dimensions. Uh, their main weapons were the pile of javelins and then gladius short swords, and in later centuries, for this type of infantry, the sword became their dominant weapon. Uh, the second rank were the principes. These were basically the same as the hastati, which, were, which we just saw, but generally better equipped because these were wealthier, wealthier, wealthier citizens who could afford better equipment and better weapons, and these generally had more widespread use of chainmail, and their armament was once again fairly similar. And third rank was the triari. These were the elite heavy armored infantry which were basically carrying the phalanx idea to uh, the more modern age, 
And these also still carry the heavy armor protection with bronze armor, uh, larger and stronger built shields. And these were armed, instead of being armed with javelins, these were armed with the heavier spears that were intended for to be used in close formation rather than just being thrown at the enemy. And also they had short swords as backup. The way that the Manipular Legion was organized is, at the very front, you would have a fairly uh, scattered formation of the Vilay uh, skirmishers. Then the Hastari, Principes, and Triari would be arranged in blocks of usually 120 to 160 soldiers and laid out in a checkerboard pattern. The reason for the checkerboard pattern is that the checkerboard made it easier for one unit to withdraw and for another unit to advance without having to disrupt their own formations. And the, the concept of the battle, battle order was supposed to be, first, the enemy is engaged by the Vilates. In case the Vilates drive the enemy back, great, everybody else is happy and free to go home. In case the Vilates are, for, are forced back and the Hastani engage, the Hastani then fight, try to get the enemy to basically, uh, or try to defeat the enemy. In case they are unable and they are being pushed back with severe casualties, they withdraw back and then the Principes engage. And then if the Principes are also drawn back or pushed back, then finally they trail our engage. And hopefully by that point, whoever has been, whoever you're fighting has been completely exhausted. So you have, you basically have a whole bunch of exhausted enemies fighting against the best troops that Rome has to field. Typically the Treari were uh, the most elite soldiers, so they would make their way up the ranks through these uh, various positions, and that way they would have the most experience as well as the best equipment. Uh, the cavalry was typically arranged on the flanks and wasn't particularly important. Uh, in fact, cavalry was never particularly important for Rome in any periods, but especially during the early manipular days, it really only carried, uh, for the mo in most engagements, a supporting role. Uh, and once again, it was it mostly consisted of nobility. Uh, the information about early cavalry is also unfortunately pretty sparse, but we know that they were usually arm armed uh, or armored with some chainmail and a small round shield, and their primary weapon would have been the javelin and then a short sword for close combat. Uh, a couple of a couple of major battles that the Romans fought uh, during the Middle Republic out of probably the thousand battles that they fought. Uh, there was the Pyrrhic War, uh, the Battle of Pericleum. This was the first engagement between the Roman Manipular Legion and the Greek Phalanx. Uh, the reason for this battle is that as Rome uh, grew its sphere of influence from just the city of Rome to neighboring counties and then neighboring tribes' territories, they eventually ended up attacking some local Greek colonies which were uh, commanded or protected by the Macedonians. So Pyrrhus of Epirus, who was one of the Greek kings, he invaded Italy with his army, which included some elephants and the Greek phalanx. And in this case, while the phalanx and the legion pretty much duked it out fairly evenly, it was the elephants who decided the battle, because the Romans had never really seen elephants up to this point, at least in a battle scenario. So the elephants routed the Roman Empire, and the Romans were defeated. Uh, this was then avenged at the Battle of Beneventum at 275 BC. This was the last battle of the Pyrrhic War and the first Roman success against elephants. It turned out that elephants are very vulnerable to jav javelins and fire. So what the Romans did was when the elephants attacked, they just threw as many javelins as they could, uh, hit the sensitive parts of the elephants. The elephants then turned around and trampled their own Greek soldiers behind themselves. And that made a Roman victory significantly easier. Uh, this victory led to the complete Roman domination of Italy, as well as uh, more, as well as enlarged de demands for sphere of influence throughout the entire Mediterranean in general. And one of the results uh, to Rome's desire for more influence and dominance was the war, were, were the wars against Carthage, and uh, aka the Punic Wars. These were begun because while Carthage was basically the dominant force on the Mediterranean. It didn't have quite as much uh, presence if, up in the north, and Rome had very strong presence in the north, and they were trying to advance south, though, so basically have two of the superpowers of the day colliding together. The first battle of the Punic War, uh, the Battle of the Lepore Islands in 260 BC, was a naval engagement between Carth Carthage and Rome, and this was a complete defeat, because up to this point, Rome didn't really have naval experience. They only had very small ships for coastal uh, protection, so in this case, the Roman crews of the Roman galleys were surrounded in the, one of the harbors, 
and they panicked and literally every single ship was captured without even much fighting. But later that same year, uh, there was a battle, uh, the Battle of Melee, where the, Romes, the Romans first finally actually came out and fought on the sea. And what they ended up doing was, as the uh, First Punic War was heating up, the Roman Empire, or the Ro Roman Republic, re requested construction of a new fleet of galleys. They, they used a Carthaginian galley as a base model and basically did some small modifications, but their most important modification to the, was not to the ship itself, but to what it carried. And that was this thing called the Corvus. It was basically a drawbridge with a giant hook in the front, so that it would be dropped onto another ship, and then the legionnaires would be able to storm across it and just basically take the other ship by assault. So would, it would then allow a naval battle to become a ground battle where the Romans were significantly better than the Carthaginians. So in this case, the Romans won because they basically boarded and captured 30 Carthagian, Carthagian ships, because with the Corvus, the Carthagians had absolutely no chance against the Roman legions, even at sea. Uh, and for the First Punic War, we get to the largest uh, battle at, at sea, the Battle of Cape Agnomus in 256 BC. Uh, according to some historians, this, this would have been one of the largest battles in history in terms of the number of men involved. And in this case, uh, the Romans fought with 330 galleys against, against approximately 350 Carthaginian galleys. The reason that this battle was fought is that Rome decided for the first time to try to invade, invade Carthaginian territory. So they brought in uh, three, uh, basically, fleets of war galleys that were protecting a fleet of transports in the middle. As the fleets approached the Carthaginian fleet that came to meet them, the Carthaginian fleet was separated into four sections. The center of the Carthaginian fleet withdrew, and they drew the Roman front two fleets away. And the other two decided to attack the transports and the remaining Roman fleet. The transports then had to flee towards the ground, but unfortunately for the Carthaginians, the Romans basically routed the fleet that was trying to draw them away, then came back and routed the two fleets that were still att attempting to attack the Roman ships. So this was a fairly nasty defeat for the Carthaginians. They had 30 ships sunk and 65 ships captured against just 24 ships that was, were lost by the Romans. So after this, uh, the First Punic War did not and did not continue for ter too terribly long, but this was the first time that pretty much any major force had defeated Carthage at sea, and this was the first time that Carthage, Carthage's Mediterranean naval dominance was uh, put under quite a bit of risk. Uh, shortly after the end of the First Punic War, we get to the Second Punic War and the then the concurrent First Macedonian War. So this was fought because uh, the Macedonian War was fought because Macedon decided to support Carthage against Rome because they realized that if Rome beats Carthage, they will expand and eventually take over Macedon, which is exactly what happened. But at the time, there was still some hope that perhaps Carthage might, might beat Rome, so these were fought concurrently. This was Rome's costliest war against Carthage, and also the most famous one. This was the, the war where Hannibal won his great victories and then had his great defeat. Uh, and at the end of this war, Rome emerged as the one dominant Mediterranean power. Uh, the most famous and the most important battle of the, of the Second Punic War, or at least from the Carthaginian side, was the Battle of Cannae in August 216 BC. This was the most devastating defeat ever suffered by Rome in history. They lost about 70,000 soldiers killed and 10,000 captured. For reference, typically when Rome would go to war against another nation, they would send 40,000 troops. In this case, they sent twice as many, and pretty much everybody was either killed or captured. So, what ended up happening was Hannibal had a smaller number of soldiers, but he had a good strategy. He took his weakest force and put it in center, and then took his strongest forces and put them at the flanks. So, as the Romans advanced, the weak center gave way and allowed the Romans to continue advancing. And what the Romans didn't realize is that they, while they were successfully pushing the center in front, they were getting enveloped by the rest of the Carthaginian infantry. And what happened to the legions is that as they continued pushing, they were pushed together just in, into closer proximity, so that the men in, in the middle were basically packed like sardines and couldn't really do anything. And the whole engagement was basically decided 
when the Carthaginian cavalry, which had earlier driven off the Roman infantry, came back and basically shoved the trap door on the backside of the Romans, after which the Roman legion was pretty much systematically hacked to death by the combined infantry and cavalry force of the Carthaginians. So, as a result, Rome, which already lost two major battles against Hannibal before this, basically was looking at having lost 130,000 soldiers, which was pretty much up to 10% of its entire male population, which was fit for war. And this was just over the course of two years. So after this, Rome finally adopted the Fabian strategy, which was uh, su suggested even before this battle. And the strategy was that instead of trying to meet Hannibal in these gigantic titanic battles, the, Ro the Romans would actually just retreat and then basically scorch the earth, so basically scorched earth policy, but in ancient Rome. And as they did this, they basically ground down Hannibal's troops in just small attacks that he could not, uh, or that he wouldn't really be able to counter because they were led by very small, very small forces. But the main thing is that during the Fabian strategy, because Hannibal didn't have these loud victories and didn't have all these spoils of war, it led to all of his uh, allies turning away from him. And as a result, Hannibal was left with just his own army that eventually had to retreat because they were basically lacking supplies lacking allies and in the middle of completely uh, foreign territory. To close the Second Punic War, there were quite a few dozen battles in between, uh, the Second Punic War ended at the Battle of Zama in 202 BC, so four, 14 years after the Battle of Cannae. In this case, the Roman army was led by a general called Scipio Africanus, and this was the last battle that Hannibal fought and his most devastating uh, defeat. In this case, what, hap what happened was the Carthaginians opened the battle with an elephant charge. So what the Romans did was they opened up the ranks and just let the elephants pass through. And after the elephants passed through, the troops in the back uh, basically dispatched them as they saw fit. Because the elephants had, once the elephant stops, it's basically just a standing target for pretty much everybody who wants to throw spears at it. And after the elephant defeat, the Roman cavalry charged the Carthaginian cavalry and drove them off the field. And in this case, the primary reason for the, Ro for the Roman success is that the Nubian cavalry, so from the land of Nubia, that used to be on Hannibal's side, had now by now defected to the Romans. So the Romans basically were using the exact same cavalry that Hannibal had been using earlier. Uh, so after this, the Roman and Carthaginian infantry clashed. Uh, the light troops basically were pretty much matched against each other. So after their, that particular engagement ended, the Carthaginians put their uh, light troops out to the wings, and then the Roman light troops were just drawn back directly. Then the armies were reorganized, and the middle two lines fought, and then the Carthaginians once again put their uh, troops onto the wings, and the Romans put theirs behind themselves. And again, the same thing happened for the third line. And after these engagements, the entire army was reorganized. And what the Carthaginians did was, by now they had their strongest infantry in the center, and their weakest infantry was basically pushed out into the flanks. But the Romans had their weakest infantry in the center, and their strongest at the flanks. Which, if you remember, was exactly what Hannibal did at Cannae. So, in this case, the Romans basically took the exact same strategy that Hannibal used against them in Cannae, and used the, used the strategy against Hannibal. So, when the Carthaginians attacked, the Roman weak center withdrew back, packed in the entire Carthaginian infantry force, and then the Roman cavalry very conveniently returned, closed the trap door, and you basically have the exact same thing except you flip, flip the Romans. And this is a really good illustration of what made Rome really successful, is that pretty much any good invention that they saw somebody come up in either weaponry or tactics, they took that and then they used it against their own inventors to great, great effect. After this battle, Carthage was pretty much done, and it was left somewhat sovereign, but without any permission to defend itself. And uh, later on, the Romans completely burned it to death at the end of the Third Punic War, but that war was significantly smaller in both magnitude and destruction than the Second War. Uh, another thing that happened during the Second Punic War was the Siege of Syracuse. At the Siege of Syracuse, the Romans were besieging uh, Syracuse because it was allied with the Carthaginians. This was also the battle and the siege where Archimedes, the famous mathematician, was killed. And among the other weapons that, um, that the Romans used was a ship called the Sambuca. 
where what they did was they took two uh, galleys and put them together as a catamaran. So the oars on the outside were left to move it, and then all the oars on the inside were just removed. And this ship deployed a fairly large covered ladder that was supposed to uh, help soldiers storm the walls of the city of Syracuse. Uh, in addition to these, they had heavy artillery gun marines. Uh, this was a Roman development on earlier galleys, which we'll uh, cover in more detail a few slides down the line. But basically, the exact same idea is that you have a galley with some ballistae on it so that they can hurl large uh, boulders at the city. Uh, Syracuse had one of the most inventive sets of defensive weapons because most of these were developed by Archimedes, one of the greatest mathematicians of antiquity. He developed better types of catapults, which unfortunately we have no idea how they looked because everybody who saw them was dead. Uh, but this is a fanciful representation of what some of his catapults might have looked like. Another thing he used is this beautifully delightful weapon called the Claw of Archimedes, where the idea is that you essentially have a crane with a hook. The hook is lowered until it catches a Roman ship, and then the crane is pulled until the Roman ship is pulled out of the water, and then either the ship breaks because it's not sturdy enough, or you just let the hook go, and then the ship is allowed to fall, and the ship once again breaks. So pretty much one shot for the ship, and the ship is done. Uh, another thing was something called Archimedes mirrors, or as some, sometimes uh, people call it, Arch Archimedes heat ray. The legend is that he had a bunch of soldiers with very polished bronze shields uh, arranged in a parabola to burn Roman ships. Probably that didn't happen. So the Mythbusters did an episode on this, and it pointed out, they pointed out that you can light some very, very dry flammable wood if you hold that wood in place for like half an hour. So most likely it didn't end up lighting anything on fire, it was more likely used to blind the crews, because the crews of these ships had to be on deck, and if they have a lot of intense sunlight going against them, then it's very difficult for them to see anything, so therefore they're going to be more susceptible to attacks from your ballistae that you're trying to defend the city with. Um, and incidentally, talking about naval technology, we get to naval technology. Uh, the main warship that was used by the Roman Republic, and later on the early Roman Empire, was the Quinquiry. And Quimpery technically means five oars, but it wasn't equipped with five decks of oars. It was equipped with oars in an arrangement that a single, a single cross-sectional bank had five men. So you still had three banks, just like the trireme, with three oars. It's just that on the bottom you had one man per oar, and on the, top, on the second and on the third you had two men per oar. So in a single cross-section you had five people, but only three oars. Uh, the ships of this type were first probably developed in Syracuse, incidentally, around 400 BC, and these were eventually adopted by the Carthaginians as the primary ship of the Carthaginian navy, and what ended up happening was one of the Carthaginian book graves early in the first Punic War was shipwrecked not far from Rome, so the Romans just took the design and scratch built their own book graves based on that design. Uh, the specifications for a typical book green would have been around 45 meters long, uh, with a beam or width of approximately 6 meters, perhaps a 100 ton displacement, and a crew of approximately 400. You have basically uh, 25 banks, uh, 25 oars per side for a total of 250 oarsmen, 30 deck crew for people who would be manning the corvus, manning the sails, and other equipment, and then approximately 120 marines to storm enemy ships and take them by boarding. Uh, in addition to the good marines, they also had medium and light ships, the biremes and the triremes, which they inherited from the Greeks and improved on the design somewhat. Uh, these were primarily used either for uh, skirmishing duties with enemy fleets or for reconnaissance or duties in areas of lower combat intensity. Uh, what the Romans did do is, as a major improvement, is they added small towers for archers so that archers could shoot from a higher platform at enemy ships and it would be easier to take out enemy crews that way. Uh, in addition to these, they also had a force of light ships. They, they were called the Liburnians. These were invented, incidentally, by the Liburnians. These were pirates from, from modern-day Croatia. And these were fairly light, basically one, one, uh, one deck, one bank ships. Uh, sometimes two, but most, mo most of the time just one. Uh, built for speed, because these people were pirates, so what they do is they would attack an enemy ship with a whole bunch of their light ships, board it, take some stuff, and then leave or maybe not leave, I don't know, 
Uh, but what the Romans did was they took the design, they added a ram, and they added deck walls to protect their rowers. And even though this made the ship a little bit uh, heavier and a little bit slower, it made it significantly more effective as a fighting platform. And this was then used as Rome's primary light ship, especially out in the outer provinces and the colonies, and so on and so forth. Uh, Meanwhile, other nations also kept up their developments. Uh, the Ptolemaic Egypt comes to mind as probably the most impressive shipbuilder of its day, even if most of its ships were not particularly practical. Uh, they focused on much heavier galleys. Uh, they had larger hexareems, septareems, octaries, octaries, enaries, and deseres mentioned as ships that were used for war. Information is pretty sparse, and for some of these, it's literally just it's listed by name, and that's it. And in this particular case, a possible reconstruction of a septreme is provided as a two-bank ship, where the bottom bank has four men, and the top bank has three men, or perhaps vice versa. But essentially, by the time that you get to these numbers, it's definitely not the number of decks that you would have, because if you have a ship with ten decks, that ship is just going to capsize and sink right away. Uh, in addition to these ships, which were in fact used for war and in combat, they had, oh, and also a possible reconstruction of a Deseris as a three banked ship with uh, four, three, and three men on the individual decks. In addition to these, they also had much larger ships, which at least the ones that were listed by number were 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 20, 30, and 40. And that 40 is a little bit confusing. Uh, these ships were probably primarily ceremonial, basically floating palaces more than anything else, uh, but still fairly large and very impressive as just basically a shipbuilding exercise. This, these are some theoretical depictions of a Tessera Conturis. Essentially, historians who study these galleys gave up on trying to make everybody cram into one ship. So they said, okay, what if they referred to a Tessera Conturis as two ships, which would have been basically a 20 and a 20, and at each bank, you'd, you'd, you basically have three banks of oars with eight, seven, and five men per oar on those banks. Um, these ships were supposed to carry around 2,500 marines on deck, but that was probably more for ceremony rather than actual combat, because this thing could, could not turn like a whale, unfortunately. And it is, of course, also possible that this is just historians making uh, their own version of history a little bit more fanciful, which is definitely something common for ancient historians to do. Uh, as we continue the story of the Middle Republic of Rome, we get to the Second and Third Macedonian Wars, which were follow-ons to the First Macedonian War fought uh, concurrently with the Punic Wars against Carthage. Uh, the Second War began when Rome decided to exert some influence over Greek uh, city-state politics. And Macedonia decided to fight back against that and say, no, we're, we will dominate Greece. And what ended up happening was Rome ended up being dominant over most of Greece, and Macedonia was just left its own kingdom. And the Third War began when one of the Macedonian kings decided to actually rebel against Roman, Roman power in the area, and this ended up with Macedonia also being annexed under Roman rule as well. A couple of the major battles here were uh, the Battle of Cynocephali Hills in 197 BC, in this battle, 30,000 Roman infantry and 25,000 cavalry faced 23 Greek uh, phalanx, in, basically infantry, and 2,000 cavalry. The Greeks in this case would have been once again arranged in the, th in the thick phalanx that were still used by, the, by Alexander of Macedon. So, in this case, what ended up happening was the Macedonian force split into two sections. The Macedonian right took their hill and then charged the Roman left down the hill. The Roman left withdrew, but Thankfully, they didn't break their formation, they just allowed some more space for the Macedonians. Whereas, on the Macedonian left, they didn't quite have time to form up at the top of their hill. So when the Romans struck, they were still trying to arrange their phalanx together. So they were routed pretty quickly and broken up. And after that phalanx was broken up, the Roman uh, part of the Roman infantry force from the right just withdrew and then attacked the other phalanx from the back. And because with the phalanx, your flank and your rear are completely unprotected, the Macedonian phalanx was routed pretty badly in this uh, particular engagement. Uh, the final battle, the Battle of Pydna in 168 BC that decided the Third Macedonian War, pretty much came down to the exact uh, same fault of the rigidity of the Macedonian phalanx, where the Macedonians had a little bit more infantry and, ironically, or not ironically, a lot more cavalry than Rome, 
So they charged the Romans, but as they charged the Romans, the Romans retreated into a hilly region, and the phalanx was no longer able to keep a straight line because they were separated by the little foothills. And when pockets opened up in the Macedonian phalanx, the Romans basically just charged those pockets, hit them from the flanks, and disintegrated the entire Macedonian uh, phalanx as they did in the Battle of the Nisophelic Hills. So after these battles, the Macedonian phalanx, which was used by Alexander to capture pretty much the entire Persian Empire, was now an extinct form of warfare. It basically lived, it, lived out its days as a dinosaur. Uh, in addition to having great field tacticians, the Romans had excellent uh, siegecraft, especially after absorbing Greece and the adoption of all of these new types of siege engines that were invented by men like Archimedes and other Greek engineers, the Romans had significantly better equipment available to themselves. Uh, they had improved ballistae uh, with ammunition up to 78 kilograms, so three talents. Also possibly heavier, but the three talent ones are listed as fairly standard for at least one, one part of Roman history. This is a modern reproduction of one such ballista. You can see some workers here for scale. Uh, this is a more standard ballista that would have been used in the field rather than for sieges, so it would have been lighter, faster to rebuild, and uh, easier to reload for a faster rate of fire. Uh, in addition to uh, the heavy ballista that they had, they had improved light ballista. The, more, the most famous one was called the Scorpio. In this case, it's still a ballista, it's just that this, the uh, sinew springs are hidden within these uh, bronze uh, containers. This is basically to make sure that the springs don't get wet, because when the springs get wet, then the ballista stops working. The Scorpio was essentially a miniature ballista used to fire arrows, and it was used for precision fire against incoming infantry. It was significantly stronger than an arrow, so it could actually penetrate a shield, because shields at the time were mostly wood, or maybe sometimes wicker baskets. And they were able to be pretty precise out to a range of around 100 meters. And you could get up to four shots per minute with this, uh, with this weapon with, if you had a very uh, well-trained crew. So it, could, it gave you a really, really good suppression fire. Uh, they also had something called the Caro Ballista, which was basically a ballista mounted on a cart. So while with previous ballistas you'd have to carry them in parts and then assemble them on site, this ballista you could basically do drive by shooting in like 200 BC. So it, it removed the need to transport uh, it in disassembled state, so therefore it gave you essentially the world's first analog to mobile artillery. Uh, they also had a man something that's called a manual ballista, which According to some historians, it might have been actually a handheld ballista that would have been used as a crossbow, but according to other historians, it was just a lighter version of a Scorpio that was light enough to be just operated by a single person without requiring a fairly large crew. In addition to ballista, they also had which something that we would recognize as a more conventional catapult called the Onager. In this case, what they did was basically took half of a ballista off and they left only one portion spring at the bottom. Uh, the torsion spring was uh, connected to a lever arm, and at the end of this lever arm was a sling. So the way that this weapon would work is you would uh, draw the arm and draw the sling backwards, load a stone into it. As the arm was released and pushed upwards by the torsion spring, the sling would have a hook up here set at a specific angle to make sure that the ball is released at a particular angle of e exit. That way you could control at which angle the ball leaves the uh, weapon. And then to make sure that you don't break your entire construction, you had a sack of chaff or wheat or something else just to soften the impact against the construction. Uh, they also obviously had battering rams, which they improved a little bit by m making a more complicated structure to protect them. This structure was called the testudo or the tortoise. And this, it was similar to earlier structures that were used by other empires, but generally better built uh, than something that the Assyrians might have used, for instance. And once again, they of course had siege towers, but much smaller than the one that we saw at Helopolis. A standard siege tower might have been around 25 meters tall, and equipped with a number of systems such as ballistae at some of its floors, rams, drawbridges, and locations for soldiers to be able to climb up to the drawbridge and basically assault the enemy wall at the height that the wall was at. Uh, a major event in Roman history that led to the complete reorganization of the army uh, was the Battle of Arausio in 105 BC. This was, in fact, Rome's most devastating defeat in terms of the numbers of soldiers lost. Uh, 
In this case, 80,000 Roman legionaries and 40,000 auxiliaries faced an army of 200,000 Cimbrian and Teutonic warriors who at the time were basically tra traveling all throughout the Western Roman Empire and breaking havoc. So what the Romans decided to do was basically teach them a lesson and drive them back beyond the borders. But unfortunately, in this case, you had a high-ranking commander who was out of fairly low birth, and he was supposed to command the entire force. But the second half of the army was commanded by a fairly uh, low-ranking uh, aristocrat called Scipio, and he decided that he's going to put his army on a different side of the river, which was unfortunately closer to the Cimbrians and the Teutons. So what ended up happening was the commander of the entire army was willing to enter negotiations to make sure that the barbarians would retreat and then perhaps they could avoid battle. So in order to avoid having all of the glory of making peace with the barbarians go to the low ranking, Scipio charged his half of the army against the uh, enraged barbarians. The barbarians completely wiped out his force and then went back and wiped out the rest of the Roman force. So pretty much all 120,000 Romans were killed in just one battle. After this, uh, there was a very serious reform by a senator called Gaius Marius in 107 BC. Uh, he removed completely the earlier uh, divisions based on wealth for the for the Roman army, and he was only he instituted a single uniform class of heavy infantry. The only requirement to join this infantry was that you were a Roman citizen, and these people were provided a salary and year-round training. So. This was the first time in Roman history that you had a salary for being a soldier, so now all of a sudden the people from poorer classes were very interested in joining the army. Uh, Non-citizens were also allowed to be enlisted as light auxiliaries. Uh, each legion consisted of around 5,000 soldiers divided into 10 cohorts of around 480 legionaries each, and each one of these was separated into six centuries. Originally a century referred to 100 men, but it proved to be a little difficult to manage 100 at a time, so it was brought down to 80 legionaries uh, later on. And in addition to these 10 cohorts, you also had an artillery crew of 60 to 100 men who would manage the ballistas and the onagers and the other weapons that we just saw. Also, uh, unlike the earlier Roman Empire, there was very widespread use of auxiliaries where every single Roman legion was supposed to be paired with a similarly sized unit of allies. Uh, these were used in a number of fairly small wars uh, that the Romans had against uh, local uh, rulers. But the most important wars that these legions ended up being used in was actually the Roman civil wars. And there were a number of civil wars that ended up being fought because now with these legions, their alliance or their loyalty was actually not to Rome, but to the generals who led them. So the generals of Rome decided to use this to their, their own advantage, including Gaius Marius who was defeated in uh, one of these civil wars. And all of these civil wars really came to a head with the civil war in which Julius Caesar was fighting against Pompey the Great. They together used to be part of the Roman triumvirate, but uh, after the death of the third member of the triumvirate, the uh, remaining two members basically fought a civil war against each other. In this case, Caesar had a smaller force of 22,000 legionaries and 8,000 allies against Pompey's 40,000 Romans and 10,000 allies. So what he decided to do was uh, perhaps wait for Pompey to attack, but Pompey, being a Roman general, realized that Caesar is going to just wait for him to attack. So he was waiting for Caesar's men to basically run out of food and other resources and just surrender. So instead of waiting for that to happen, Caesar arranged his infantry and advanced against Pompey. Pompey decided to use his cavalry advantage to rout Caesar's cavalry and then attack his infantry from the side. So here, uh, Caesar had a secret attack or a secret plan where he left an extra line of soldiers in ambush. And when Pompey's cavalry attacked, they basically came up and fought against the cavalry at short ranges, basically stabbing spears into them. After Pompey's cavalry was routed, Caesar's cavalry uh, basically charged it off of the field. And all of a sudden, Pompey's entire left side was open. So Caesar charged his weak left with his elite division 10, and, uh, or his elite, elite 10th legion, and that basically crushed the Pompey's army, and then Pompey ran away and was, and there was later executed by people in uh, Ptolemy, Egypt. Uh, and these civil wars continued, uh, or after this victory, uh, Julius Caesar was proclaimed emperor, or dictator for life, not quite emperor, 
Uh, this led to a lot of resentment in the Senate, who wanted him to be out of power, so eventually they assassinated him. The assassination of Caesar led to another civil war, which was the last of the civil wars, and that was the civil war between Mark Anthony and Octavian. Uh, and this war came to a head at the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. In this case, Octavian had, had 250 light galleys, primarily the Liburnians that we discussed, facing Anthony's 230 heavy war galleys and 50 transports. Primarily, these would have been the Quinquirines, but also ships up to a 10 were mentioned as participating in the battle, including Mark Anthony's own flagship. In this case, Octavian's ships uh, had the advantage of being more maneuverable, and because they were armed with ballistae, they could basically punch holes through uh, Mark Anthony's ships and basically be man maneuvered out of range and out of position fairly quickly. The combat itself was pretty, pretty indecisive, with Anthony's fleet having a slight advantage, but at some point in the battle, Cleopatra, who also had her own fleet, decided to retreat. Anthony panicked, or perhaps he was freaked out that Cleopatra would leave him, so he abandoned his entire fleet and chased after her. And after he abandoned his fleet, everybody in his fleet thought that, oh my gosh, our general is panicking, therefore we must have lost, and everybody panicked as well. So they were outed by Octavian's navy and also were defeated. And after this, uh, you basically have the Roman Empire, where Octavian is proclaimed the first Roman Emperor, Octavian Augustus, and we have yet another slight reorganization to the legionary structure. There is improvement in equipment. So the most famous uh, Roman armor, which you see here, Laurica Segmentata, this was mostly introduced during the early Roman Empire. And this was built from bent strips of iron, or basically very early type of steel, held together by leather straps and to a uh, leather uh, understructure. Uh, there was the new helmet type, which was called the Imperial Gallic Helmet, that had improved protection for the neck and the back, and large ear guards, which still allowed you to hear everything that you needed to, but gave better protection to the side of the face. You had better shield, so you have the classic Roman shield, which is a large uh, curved rectangle, appearing at this time. Uh, these were larger in overall size, and given a semi-cylindrical profile so that you could better protect yourself uh, with a single shield. The primary construction was made out of wood and then covered with leather on both sides, and then a metal boss on the center so that, first of all, it would protect the hand when you're holding the shield, and second of all, it could be used as a punching weapon if you needed to punch somebody with the shield as well. Uh, subsequent centuries, however, unfortunately saw a gradual decline in the equipment that the legionaries had available. So for three and four, we see sort of the heyday of the Roman Empire, uh, with 180 and around 280 AD, but as the Roman Empire progressed, it became more and more dependent on uh, foreign allies, and less and less dependent on its own primary Roman legion, so eventually we see the decline of the Roman Empire through a number of reasons, but one of them is essentially the decline of the Roman structure for the military. Uh, and sort of the beginning of the end for the Western Roman Empire, according to some historians, can be considered as the Battle of Adrianople in 378. In this case, the Romans were trying to push out Goths who were invading the Roman Empire, essentially as just a horde of barbarians trying to look for the pastors. So 25,000 Romans faced possibly up to 80,000 Goths, although 80,000 might have been the total number, including women and children, so there might have been only 20,000 actual Goth soldiers out in the field. And in this case, the, there were initially two Roman armies uh, attempting to attack this force, but the army of uh, Emperor Valens decided that they wanted to have all of the glory for victory to themselves, so he marched his soldiers excessively quickly, they were tired, before giving them a chance to rest or waiting to group together with the other Roman army, he attacked directly, and while his initial attack was repelled because the Goths had a fairly sturdy uh, uh, base, basically that they took all of their wagons with which they were migrating, put them into a circle, and then used them as a makeshift cat fortress in the middle of an open field. At, at the point where the Roman infantry was pushed back and was regrouping, the Gothic cavalry, which at the time was basically grazing in the nearby fields, returned and completely destroyed and routed the Roman infantry. And after this point, you basically just see a series of sometimes victories, sometimes defeats, but mostly just all these various tribes encroaching upon Roman uh, territory in the West, and the Roman Empire eventually coming to a uh, termination. Uh, but meanwhile, the Byzantine Empire was rising in the East, or the Eastern Roman Empire. And these 
had eventually a very major reorganization of their military. Uh, their primary ground unit was the heavy shock cavalry called the Cataphract. These were borrowed from the Persians, and uh, they had full body armor protection both for the horse and for the rider. Uh, both of these were covered typically in scale armor, but sometimes chain mail was also used. And they were armed with a lance, a mace, and a sword, two of which are seen here. In addition to the cataphracts, they had the corsoris, the light cavalry, which had significantly less armor, so they were faster and more maneuverable. And these were typically armed either with lances for flanking attacks against the enemy, or sometimes bows just to keep yourself as a ranged unit. The Byzantines also had heavy infantry, which evolved from late war Roman legionnaires, so now we see significantly smaller and more rounded shields. We see a scale or male armor rather than the big Lorica segmentata, which we saw with the Romans. Uh, they, saw, they used spears for close formation combat and then swords for close combat, so very similar to the primary Roman Imperial Legion. And in terms of naval units, uh, initially the Byzantine Empire inherited the same weapons that the Romans were using uh, on, at, on sea, but they developed their own type of ship, and this was called the Drawman, or the Runner. There were, this is believed to have evolved from the Liburnian, uh, but it was built with a fully covered deck, and they also abandoned the ramp, and instead they were armed with ranged weapons such as the ballista. A couple of major new features was that you had a raised cabin in the back for the captain, and a raised forecastle up on the prow, so this is the first time that we see a galley with something other than just either a completely flat profile, or a flat profile with just a, a small turret, small uh, castle sticking out the front. In this case, the castle is actually built into the shape of the ship. Uh, also, the drama eventually evolved into a family, which sometimes included heavier two and three bank galleys, but the primary type uh, that was most commonly used had just one bank of ports. And eventually, over the couple of centuries, they evolved to use latine sails. So, early dramas used rectangular sails, just like all the galleys we saw in the Mediterranean earlier, but eventually you see the introduction of triangular latine sails. The advantage of these is that with good seamen, you can you drive these into the wind by effectively using them as an air foil. The mechanics of this are a little bit complicated to explain right now, but I'll be happy to explain that at, at any point if necessary. Uh, these were probably invented somewhere around Arabia or India at some uh, point around AD 0, according to some historians, and they made their way to uh, the Mediterranean, specifically the Byzantines, by approximately 550 AD. Which, and they're believed to have been borrowed essentially from the Arabs that the Byzantines were fighting at the time. Uh, the <coughs> Byzantines also had a number of new types of weapons. Uh, the main one is the traction trebuchet. So the idea behind the traction trebuchet is that you still have everything that a regular trebuchet has, except you do not have a large weight at the top, instead you have a whole bunch of people pulling on ropes. And it's the combined force of all of these people pulling on these ropes that gives the uh, launch to the projectile that is being used to uh, bombard the enemy. Uh, these were first invented in China, actually, and possibly used as early as 400 BC, and eventually they were brought to the, uh, brought to the West through the migrations of a people called the Pannonian of Ars. These were Eurasian stuffed nomads that eventually migrated from somewhere in Mongolia to somewhere closer to the Byzantine Empire. And Byzantium uh, was using these by also approximately 550 BC. Uh, so this particular structure was significantly simpler than a counterweight trebuchet because you did not need to have all of the structure to raise a gigantic counterweight very high up, but it still gave you better performance than something like an orange or a ballista because you were not limiting yourself to the power that you could have in a bunch of springs, but you actually had a whole herd of people pulling on ropes at the exact same time. And the most important and the most classic Byzantine weapon you have was Greek fire. This was the first incendiary liquid that was fairly commonly used in combat, essentially the world's first flamethrower. Um, with it, with uh, the story of Greek fire, it's possible one of the precursors might have actually been used as far back as 424 BC. At the Siege of Delium, there's a weapon that was described as having a log that was hollowed out, uh, or a beam that was hollowed out, used as the projector. There was a cauldron at the bottom, uh, fitted to this uh, log, and it was filled with a, burning, a, a mixture of burning coal, sulfur, and some sticky resin. And there was a bellows in the back that was blown through, uh, through the stack, and as the air was blown, 
it took the material from the uh, from the cauldron and pushed it up the beam and basically projected it into the city of Delhi. Uh, it's not entirely sure how effective this would have been, but the description is that it stuck to the bird to the walls and set the walls on fire because the walls had wooden construction uh, in some sections. So we might in here we might have the representation of the first flamethrower in history and technically the great great grandfather of Greek fire. Um, Subsequently, there were a number of experiments that were that went on in various Greek cities, but proper Greek fire has been uh, classically attributed to an engineer called Kalinikos, who ran away from Heliopolis to Byzantium when Heliopolis was taken over by the uh, Muslim invasion. It's likely that his design just improved on prior experiments because there are records of similar weapons used by by the Byzantines from early decades. But he is the name that is associated in uh, a lot of historiography. The properties of a Greek fire is that it's a liquid, it burns, and it burns even on water. So if it makes a film on water, it still continues to burn. So you cannot put it out by just pouring water on top of it. The exact composition is unfortunately lost uh, because it was treated as a state secret and the knowledge was very compartmentalized. And one of the uh, examples of how compartmentalized it was was that the Muslims actually ca captured a few of these ships with some of the engineers who were manning them. But because most of the engineers who were manning the other sections of the weapon were killed in the battle, they could never figure out how to get the entire thing to work. Um, it is known uh, from one incomplete formula that it used pine resin and sulfur. It's very likely its primary ingredient was crude oil, and the pine resin from recent experiments would have most likely been used as a thickener. Uh, and there were a number of methods for deployment. The most famous and the most, I guess, um, impressive one was called the siphon, uh, and this would have basically been literally a flamethrower that projected a stream of liquid. Uh, the structure based on descriptions from ancient uh, writers, most likely there was a bronze pump that was manned by people who that pressurized air into a container. The container had oil or whatever mixture was used for Greek fire that was heated from the bottom by a hearth. And the oil in this case, the reason that you had to heat it is that it's much easier to set fire to preheated oil than to oil that's just cold. So it preheated the oil to whatever temperature they were able to get. And then the, once the pressure inside was reached a significant, uh, significant level, a valve would have been opened and the very hot oil would have been allowed to come out of a nozzle right over a fire. And the fire at the nozzle would have actually been the, the, the uh, component that sets fire to the entire stream of oil. So all of a sudden you have a stream of very hot burning oil being raised at the enemy. Uh, so in this case, uh, you have a couple of possible depictions where you have no idea how these would have actually looked in uh, action, but these are some of the possible depictions based on what might have been done as a reasonable engineering uh, feat. In addition to just the large siphon, they also have something called the Cairo siphon, which it's not exactly certain what it might have been, but there are depictions of essentially a person holding a little handheld flamethrower that was also using Greek fire. Most likely, what would have uh, what what this would have been is a uh, container of this flammable liquid that might have been either pre-pressurized or pre hand-operated with a syringe from the back, and there might have either been a small rope that was set on fire at the front. So that the liquid was, start with the, the liquid was set on fire upon exit, or alternatively, this might have been used to just pump all of the soil at an enemy target and then set it on fire manually after the fact. These were uh, first mentioned around 900 AD, and specifically, their recommendation was that these are really good weapons to be used against siege towers, but they were also briefly deployed with some field armies in battles as well. Uh, also, the for a significantly more simple uh, deployment method. There were just ceramic grenades filled with this liquid, which were uh, wrapped in cloth. The cloth was set on fire, and after, shoot, after shooting this with a catapult, the jar would just break, and the liquid would be set on fire and spread all over the place. Sometimes uh, they also included caltrops as payload, basically just to serve as fragmentation. So you basically have the first incendiary slash fragmentation weapon. Uh, and in addition to all of these developments, the Byzantine Empire also had a fairly large chain across the Golden Horn, which was the harbor that led to Byzantium. 
and it's drawn in a painting here. And these are sections which are supposed to be parts of the original chain, although these might also just be reproductions in a museum in Istanbul these days. The reason for this chain to exist was it basically defended Byzantium from any sort of naval attack at right against its walls, because they would just be able to raise the chain, and then no ships that might be able might might be interested in entering the harbor would be able to enter the harbor. And uh, with that, we conclude the portion for the uh, Roman slash Byzantine Empire and look very briefly at a couple of the other empires uh, that uh, concurrently existed. Uh, very important was the Parthian Empire. Uh, it was the empire that ruled over modern day Iran between 247 BC and 228 AD. And their primary units were the cataphract heavy cavalry. In fact, the Romans borrowed their cataphracts in the Eastern Roman Empire from these guys. And these were protected by heavy amounts of mail and scale armor, and typically recruited from Parthian aristocracy. In addition to them, they had light cavalry archers, which were recruited from commoners, and basically had no armor, just a bow. But these were armed with very good composite bows, and trained extensively, in addition, among other things, to be very good at the Parthian shot, which is shooting backwards at an enemy while in full gallop going forwards. This was used very effectively by the Parthians at the Battle of Carai, where a Roman army invaded Parthia because um, Crassus of Rome wanted to also become a famous general with victories. And what the Parthians did was they drew the Roman cavalry behind themselves, started retreating, and as the Roman cavalry was chasing them, they all turned around and basically shot the Roman cavalry to death while still galloping away from them. Uh, in addition to uh, cavalry, they also had war elephants, which were equipped with small towers, so essentially uh, locations for javelin and arrow uh, or bow and arrow troops to shoot at the enemy from above. Uh, at the same time, we have some developments also in China, with specifically the Eastern Zhu Dynasty. We have the first crossbows. Uh, the crossbow was probably developed in China around 600 BC, and it's possible that they might have borrowed it from a, borrowed a similar weapon from the Vietnamese before developing their own version of the crossbow. These typically used bronze or iron bolts for ammunition instead of arrows, because with a crossbow you can use a significantly smaller projectile. And the main advantage of a crossbow is that it's much simpler to train a soldier to use this than an actual bow and arrow. Because here you just put a bolt in, cock the, cock the string, and shoot by pressing on a trigger. Whereas with a bow and arrow you need to make sure that your posture is right, you need to make sure that you're holding the bow and arrow correctly, otherwise you're just not going to shoot anything at all. Uh, and around 350 BC, we have the Chinese repeating crossbow, which is called the Zhu Genu, uh, because the most famous version of it was improved by somebody by the name of Zhu Geliang around AD 200, but the first versions might have been as old as 350 BC. This was the world's oldest semi-automatic weapon. It gave you a fairly high rate of fire, uh, but at the cost of being fairly low power and decreased accuracy. The way that it worked was you had a box magazine for a bunch of bolts that was connected to a lever up in front, so as you drew the lever forward, the, uh, the string would get caught in a nook in the back, and then as you then drew the lever backward, it drew the string back, 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 until it was pushed up against a board and fired the bolt. And then you would basically just continue pushing and pulling the, the rod until you ran out of ammunition with your crossbow. So if you had a large army that needed to put a lot of firepower down against an enemy, this was unparalleled to any other weapon in antiquity. Uh, in addition to crossbows and repeating crossbows, uh, we have the development of various other types of weapons. Uh, so if you remember, pole arms were important for, for pretty much every single major civilization and empire of the ancient world. The Chinese version was called the dagger axe pole arm. It typically had a head at the end which looked generally like that. And this, was, this is the oldest known dedicated weapon in China, as in it wasn't intended maybe for also hunting or also farming or just like various other duties. It was intended as a weapon of war and only as a weapon of war. And as with most other pole arms, this was best used for open terrain, but there's quite a bit of it in inner China. And over the uh, millennia that this weapon was used, because it was pretty much used all the way up until the early modern period, it evolved into a very large number of subtypes, including uh, versions with spears at the end, versions with larger heads on one side or heads on both sides, and 
for the number of different weapons that you had on the exact same shaft. Sometimes it's called the halberd of China or the Chinese halberd because it's very similar to a European weapon called the halberd, which we will cover during the uh, medieval uh, period. Uh, and of course, the Great Wall of China, how can we not mention it? Uh, it was built technically by pretty much every Chinese ruler over history, uh, but the most famous iteration of it was built by Emperor Qin Shi Huang, or Shi Huang Di, depending on who you listen to, and his work was around 220 to 210 BC. So after he unified China and became China's first one emperor, he decided to take all of these sections of wall. So on this map, what you see is sections in yellow were built before Shi Huang Di, sections in uh, orange were built specifically under Shi Huang Di, and then red and other colors were built later. So he took sections of this yellow wall and put either his own wall right next to it, or just reinforce those sections. And the main thing that he uh, also contributed is he joined some sections of wall so that they were no longer just a little wall that stands in the middle of nowhere with an end here and there, but it's connected to the next wall over so that it makes a more continuous barrier across the entire perimeter. These were primarily built to protect China against various nomadic tribes that lived up in the north, so essentially the predecessors of the Mongols and the Hunts. And at the time of Shi Huangdi's death, the wall was referred to as the Wall of 10,000 Li, which would translate to 5,000 kilometers. It's not entirely sure how long it would have lasted or how, how long it would have stretched because his own wall is very, very poorly uh, surviving. This is a section of the original wall, and this is a section of the original wall. So by this point in history, much of it looks just like regular terrain or very, very, very crumbly wall. So the 10,000 Li was possibly an exaggeration, but it is also possible that it would have been a fairly accurate representation of the wall of Chain. And there's not terribly much known about warships of China at the period, but a couple of them, a couple of these types are mentioned in significantly later books. Among them are something called the Meng Chong, which was an assault warship. These were covered in leather, and apparently some of these ships were used as fire ships at the Battle of Red Cliffs, which was the largest battle in terms of manpower in Chinese history. Uh, in addition, a couple of Chinese empires used these fairly large floating fortresses, which were basically just a barge uh, with a ma major installation on top of it. And these were used to be, these were used along the Yellow River and the uh, other rivers of China, essentially as just a mobile base for an army. So if an army wanted to move and attack another uh, empire, it would have been much easier to move the entire army on a large number of these barges than to have them all do forced marches over the difficult terrain in China. So obviously these would have then been the primary targets for fire ships. And here you can see a illustration which could have been uh, seen at the Battle of Red Cliffs where you have a formation of these large barges and various support ships and an attack of fire ships coming in from the side because everything here having been made out of wood, if you set fire to it, your entire ship basically goes out uh, within just a few hours. Uh, and you have the invention of the stirrup. So the oldest, uh, the oldest pair of stirrups are from China and they date to approximately 320 AD. So with the stirrup, you all of a sudden have very uh, much better uh, capabilities for your cavalry because your cavalry is no longer trying to hold on for dear life to the horse with its legs. They can actually stand in their seat and have a significantly firmer grasp, so it gives them a better, uh, better grasp on their lance, better accuracy for their archery, and so on and so forth. And for the close for today's lecture, a little bit of a look about uh, civilizations from uh, Mesoamerica. This is Teotihuacan, uh, a civilization that lived in modern-day Mexico between 100, approximately 250 and 550 AD. At its height, uh, around 400, it would have been the largest city in the Western Hemisphere and possibly the 10th largest city anywhere in the world. This is actually a picture of what Teotihuacan looks like. It's taken from one of the pyramids, so you see a fairly large avenue, another large pyramid, and very large number of constructions on both sides. There's influence uh, from this culture that is seen in southern Mexico and even into Central America. And when the, when the empire or the culture of Teotihuacan collapsed, pretty much all of this was abandoned. And a couple of centuries later, these abandoned ruins were discovered by the Aztecs. 
And the Aztecs were so taken aback that they called this place Teotihuacan, which means the birthplace of the gods. And the Aztecs said, oh my gosh, only the gods could build something as great as this. And after that, uh, there was a fairly large uh, culture among the Aztecs to call themselves the children of the gods, because everything that the Aztecs did, they basically ca ca uh, copied from what they saw in these abandoned ruins. Uh, in Teotihuacan, we unfortunately don't even know what the people of Teotihuacan would have called themselves, because they would, didn't really leave much of a language that we can uh, decipher. But from their illustrations, we know that they had spears and darts, and these are very often depicted with decorations of feathers on them. Here we see basically a original image from Teotihuacan with some soldiers uh, giving tribute to a king, and they are armed with what is believed to be darts for throwing, and then spears for uh, close combat. And then here's a possible illustration of what they might have looked like in life. Uh, they also had been uh, very fond of the autolotl, which you might imagine, or you might remember, was the first ranged weapon. And the autolotl, in fact, is also a word from the Aztec language. Uh, and in fact, for the people of Teotihuacan, the autolotl was a very important uh, weapon. So one of the great kings of Teotihuacan, his name was translated as autolotl or spear throw or owl. Uh, I guess owls were brave, but we see that it would have been fairly honorable for a king to be associated with the spear thrower. And we see a fairly large uh, number of depictions of spear throwers. So this is a depiction from a uh, later bas relief that was found in the same uh, location. And in addition to spears and then the spear thrower, they had a fairly large number of contusing maces, which are basically round stones with a round hole in the middle and with a mace head up on top. And sometimes this mace head was made with a point so that you could easy, more easily puncture through a person's head. Uh, and obviously they had some uh, knowledge about shields. I'm kind of proud because both of these two pictures were taken by me at a uh, display of art artifacts from Teotihuacan in California just this past break. So here you can see a soldier holding some rectangular shields and then some mythical bird holding a circular shield. Presumably these might have been made out of something like wicker baskets or uh, a related fairly light material, but maybe also out of wood. And in addition to the Empire of Teotihuacan, further down south we see a classical period Maya, right around the same time period. Uh, they use much the same equipment, but with the Mayans we also see evidence of them using blowguns, and possibly the ammunition that they would have used would have been darts uh, with curare poison. This is basically poison that's developed from a plant, and it causes paralysis in a target very, very quickly. Uh, and in addition, they used a weapon called the Makahul. Also, the Aztec name, because I'm not entirely sure what the Maya name for this was. This was basically a wooden paddle stat studded with sharpened obsidian blades among the sides. So sometimes people would say it's class it could be classified as something like a sword, but in action it would have been more like a saw rather than a sword, where it would have been sawing through a target body rather than just giving a slashing weapon. So. Uh, according to some weapon typologists, they just classified this as their own class because nothing like this was ever used in the, the uh, Eastern Hemisphere. Uh, and uh, one of, in addition to their weapons, they had uh, various defensive equipment. The oddest one is probably the Ichka Lupili. Once again, the Aztec name for this thing. This is basically a very thick padded cotton shirt which was left in brine until it was completely saturated and then dried. And then all of that salt that was left inside the shirt hardened it and made it completely impervious to attacks from uh, darts and from spears and possibly even against slashes by the Makahutu. So the soldiers of the Mayans would wear this over their bodies as basically a breastplate and in addition they had some, some amount of wooden shields that were used but this was the primary uh, body armor. And that is it.